Welcome, uh, Setak Karaman. Um, Setak Karaman is a Star Trapper Associate Professor of Aeronautics and Astronautics at the MIT. He will talk today about unsupervised end-to-end -end learning of uh, driven using novel photorealistic simulations. Um, Setak holds a PhD degree in electrical engineering and computer science, also from MIT, which he finished in 2012. His research uh, lies mainly in the broad areas of robotics and control theory, and uh, he's mainly uh, busy with the application of probability theory, stochastic processes, stochastic geometry, formal methods, and optimization for high-performance uh, cyber-physical systems. And among other, uh, among other unsupervised um, methods or learning methods he used, uh, he's working with sparse methods and self-supervised multi-model transformation. Um, notable is that he received quite uh, a lot of awards, including the Army Research Office Young Investigator Award, the Office of Naval Research, uh, Naval Research Young Investigator Award, and in 2017, he receives the IEEE Robotics and Automation Society Early Career Award. I want to welcome Sertak and uh, want to give you the stage now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks a lot, Fabian and Julian, for inviting me. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I also really look forward to the other talks. It, it seems like a great lineup of speakers. I'm truly looking forward to the workshop. Um, I think that, uh, you know, Fabian, you might need to unshare yes. so that I can share. Um, I and if that sets up, I want to say that, you know, um, uh, it's really great to be together with the intelligent vehicles community. Um, you know, I, I submitted my very first paper uh, to IV uh, when I was an undergraduate student, sort of roaming the corridors of Istanbul Technical University. And so the conference is really dear to my heart, and it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Okay, um, you know, thank you so much, everyone. And, and you know, I, I think that um, I, I believe I will be easily be able to fit in the time slot. You know, I have a few sections on this presentation. I think if we run out, I'll, I'll cut out one of the sections and I think we'll be fine. And, and you know, the um, organizers just feel free to just kind of come in and interrupt. I have a clock here, but just in case I go over, please don't be shy. Um, and today, everybody, I'd like to talk to you about unsupervised learning for end-to-end -end autonomous driving. Um, specifically using uh, novel photorealistic simulation environments. I'm an associate professor at MIT, and I, I have a number of uh, uh, different lines of work at MIT that I'll talk to you about. Um, at the same time, I'm, I'm one of the co-founders. Um, um, for a while, I've been the president of Optimus Ride. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, it's a startup. Uh, now it's a little bit beyond the startup. Um, it, it employs more than 100 engineers. And if, if, if we get to it, I'd like to talk a little bit more about Optimus Ride as well. Um, so let me get started. Um, so I'd like to get started by saying that, you know, we've actually done a lot uh, in robotics where my background is in. Uh, we have a lot of robots that can kind of um, navigate um, in, in, in different environments completely autonomously, uh, but, in, but in very structured cases. Um, for example, we have robots at Mars. They can, you know, navigate environments without interacting with any other human. Or we have robots in, in warehouses where, again, there's no humans and they can do wonders. And I think one of the next biggest challenges for our generation is to put these robots uh, into environments where humans are omnipresent. And in fact, I would say that, you know, in some cases, this, these humans may not even, let alone not using their services, they may not even be aware that there are robots operating in that environment. And I think one of the most important challenges that we're facing right now is to get robotic systems into these types of environments. And I would say that, um, yes, you can go around, collect data and, and label them. Um, I think that you know, the introduction made by Fabian and Julian was actually a perfect uh, introduction to my talk, but I'll kind of show this case. So here is kind of um, a kind of thing that may happen when you're on the road. So you just kind of, I don't know how well the video is streamed, but you just kind of seen a, a video I found on YouTube. It seems like somebody rented a Ferrari and, and it was barely uh, missed an accident. Um, and so these kinds of cases do not come along too far, um, but the thing is that we need autonomous vehicles to work very well in these cases, probably a lot better than humans, in order so that we can deploy them at scale confidently in human-centered environments. I have a number of different things that I'd like to talk about, but the first thing that I want to touch upon is some reinforcement learning um, ideas that we've been developing in something that we call a data-driven simulation. Uh, and this is joint work with a number of others at MIT. 
Um, so I, I, this has been kind of made very clear, but I just would like to say that um, there's a bit of a difference between supervised and unsupervised clearly. And, and we ideally we want methods um, that would enable driving in a way that we don't have to label data. Obviously we might want to collect a lot of data, but ideally we don't want to label it. I would go one step further and say, maybe we don't want to collect a lot of data either. So how can we get some data and make it really powerful? Uh, so the focus of this presentation will be something called end-to-end -end driving. Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean finding policies that are camera to steering angle. And so we don't want to kind of split up the tasks in between, okay? Uh, the input will be the camera images and the output will be steering angle or it could be gas brake pedals and so on. So a typical approach here is to do some sort of mutation learning. For example, you can have human driving uh, collected a lot of data uh, in a number of different cases. Um, and then uh, the, the vehicle would learn looking at that, you know, camera to steering angle uh, pairs. Uh, people made a lot of advances in this. Um, however, I'd say that sort of data collecting can, can be dangerous um, in the kinds of scenarios that you've seen, especially in edge cases. Even then it requires tremendous amount of data uh, to learn driving very well. As I said earlier, how can you make the best out of a little bit of data that you've collected? Um, yet, even when you collect a lot of gold standard data, you know, the real edge cases come up like once every trillion miles. Uh, that's about the time that you would get, for example, a fatal accident. So the proposed approach will be to allow, allow agents to learn on their own uh, using a novel data-driven simulation environment. Um, and the way we're gonna do that is that we're gonna take some real data and manipulate it uh, to create new cases, including edge cases. Um, so to, to kind of showcase, you know, we may have somebody driving um, the car and then you can imagine that, you know, we can somehow manipulate this data so that we can try to understand what would the system see if it were to deviate from this path a little bit. Let me show you a little bit more. So this is some of the original data that we've collected. What we'll do with this is that we will want to see, for example, what would happen if you were to turn a little bit this way or turn a little bit that way. Um, and then, you know, adding into this some location data, we will then be able to say to the robot, for example, okay, if you're here, you're kind of out the road. If you're here, you're in the road. And we'll allow the system to understand and, and you know, test around these kinds of cases and to learn, for example, in this case, how to stay on the road. Um, and I'm just going to... Um, and, and we'll do the learning um, in a bit of a reinforcement learning fashion. I, I think everybody is familiar with this, but uh, the idea would be that we have some sort of an environment in reinforcement learning where we apply control, we get some observations and we get reward according to our observations. And then our agent tries to do a number of experiments in this environment in order to maximize reward. For example, in this case, reward could be um, high if you stay in the middle of the road um, and you would get low reward or maybe even penalty if you want to think about it that way if you go outside the road or, or crash into another car. Um, this is easier said than done. So I think I'm going to show one slide to tell you a little bit of the system. Um, the key idea in being able to transform these images is to first compute depth data on that image, then make that into a 3D observation, manipulate that 3D observation that you get, which is typically in, in form of a point cloud and then reproject that 3D observation so that you would get, for example, how would the scene would look like if you are, let's say half a meter uh, to the left or half a meter to the right. Um, this is the most basic ingredient. Um, I don't have time to get into this, but my group has also worked a lot on deep learning depth estimation uh, in the past. And so we're using a lot of those tools uh, in order so that we can generate that depth and manipulate the scene so that we can put the car left or right. Um, this is just an example. Um, we can do, we can imagine things, for example, whereby you can do some sort of segmentation, take the image of a car, manipulate that car in your scene and put it into your scene. So you could, for example, hallucinate a car in front of you when there's no car. Um, this kind of a simulation, uh, which we call Travis, um, is, is very important because the simulation ends up being photorealistic. Ultimately, this is exactly, or uh, not exactly, but kind of close to what the car would see if this car were, was, was, would be um, operating out in the real world. Um, and skipping some of the details, of course, you know, many people will be available, uh, many people um, may be up to speed already here, but there's a lot of model-based simulations that basically use uh, the mathematics behind rendering and 3D models to generate scenes. 
Uh, they were really great, but it's been very hard to make them photorealistic. Uh, trends from those have been very hard. In addition, there are simulators whereby um, you have sort of some, do some sort of a domain transfer um, by, you know, essentially looking at all possible domains. Uh, so you can color the cars in, in, in weird different colors, um, or you can color the road in, in, in weird different colors, um, hoping that when you get to the real world, it's also an instantiation of, of all these weird types. And I'd say this is a third piece of simulator whereby you, you get some photorealism out of it. Uh, not that you don't have to label anything uh, in this case. Uh, the, the driving data is basically collected by the, the driver driving. Um, and then in the reinforcement learning simulator, we can take a look at what happens if you go left or right. And so there's no labeling across the board. Um, even the depth sensing. So even the depth sensing, we have a few papers that we're using here. Um, the sensing itself is completely self-supervised. And if anybody's curious, I'm happy to go into details in the q &A. Um, and so we kind of um, uh, compare this method. Um, so our method is, is called, is the one on the, the far right. Uh, it's the policy optimization in data-driven uh, simulation in Travis. Uh, we compare that to domain randomization, um, some sort of a domain adaptation with domain randomization, um, as well as the imitation learning uh, type, type of setups. Um, and here, uh, one of the things that I plotted in A is um, is the mean trajectory that you get. It's a little bit hard to see, but what's kind of easy to see is how many crashes that you get if you utilize this approach. Um, so these crashes are obviously uh, in some sort of, a, you know, um, is, is, a, is a bit of a, a safe setting where if the car were to crash, we would kind of take over. Uh, but there's many takeovers in domain randomization as you would expect. Um, it just requires probably a lot of different domains to try out. Uh, imitation learning is a lot better. Uh, but this kind of a policy does a lot better even than imitation learning because in simulation, you can explore some edge cases that don't come up in imitation learning necessarily. Um, and here um, is the policy uh, that is implemented on a car in a very simple uh, road setting. Uh, this is kind of a setting that we have available kind of nearby um, in Massachusetts, nearby at MIT. Uh, I'd like to emphasize that this is a direct deployment without any adjustments to the network whatsoever. And so we take the policy that performs um, in the Travis simulator that I described, and we just basically transfer the policy into reality. Um, obviously, I should note that uh, we use the very same environment to collect the initial data, uh, but then you've seen in the comparison that if you just use that data for imitation learning, we don't get good amount of results. Um, so that concludes the first part of my talk. Um, I would like to kind of um, give you a bit of an overview on some of the other things that we do sort of going forward. Um, in order to advance this work, uh, one of the things that we've been wanting to do for a long time is to create one of the most photorealistic simulations ever. Um, and as you can imagine, that could potentially be done by going into an environment and actually mapping it to such a high quality so that when you uh, look at its simulation, it becomes as realistic as possible. So uh, in a joint work with a large group of other set of people, I'll describe what we do over there. This work is actually motivated by us trying to get drones to go extremely fast. And so um, uh, I follow these drone racing events uh, quite vigorously. Um, maybe some people here uh, are familiar with it. I'll, I'll show you a video. Uh, it's going to run very fast. Um, I don't think it'll stream that fast. Uh, normally, when I show this in person, I say, you know, if you get dizzy, feel free to look look away from the video and then look back. Um, probably the streaming won't be very good. But what you're seeing here is the view from a camera image on mounted on a drone. This camera image is beamed back to a human pilot. Uh, this human pilot has remote uh, control as well as these goggles. And looking at this image, navigating super fast in this very complicated environment, racing with others. Uh, you know, just, I don't know, just as a nerd, I look at this and I say, wow, can't we do the same thing with robots? Uh, I'd say that we're pretty far away from this. Uh, this is almost unimaginable. They're reaching about 50 miles an hour. I, I'd say we'd be, we, I, I feel great if we can do like similar environments in five miles an hour. Um, and so we were really interested in trying to do this. Um, and, and it's not just this, but there's a lot of other opportunities. For example, here you're seeing another human piloted drone kind of going through a forest. So imagine like some sort of a search and rescue mission, you know, somebody's lost and you need to find them and you're willing to get to them like in the next hour or so, because, you know, they may be suffering from some sort of bleeding or maybe cold. Uh, so imagine dispatching some drones that can look for people. 
Um, and also there's a lot of applications in media. Here's a drone filming a car race. Um, and so these are pretty hard to do at we need sort of trained people. Um, can we do the same? We ask in my group, can we do this and, and potentially more things that human pilots would even be incapable of doing? So we uh, believe it or not, um, you know, we, we, we end up building these kinds of drones. For example, if you get a camera off the shelf, it's typically 30 Hertz or it runs at 60 frames a second, 30 frames a second because your eye captures that way. Uh, but we run cameras at a kilohertz, um, put some really complicated electronics on these things and try to fly. And of course, the first thing that happens is that you set up your environment, you try to fly and crash into something. And all of a sudden, you know, uh, you, you kind of completely destroyed the equipment that you built in like two months. Um, and not to mention it was so expensive because it had all these gadgets on it. Um, so we can do some really interesting things in, in, in pretty uh, you know, constrained environments. I don't know if you're gonna see this, uh, but you're seeing a drone flying through very fast and from one window, now it turns around, flips through another window, and then it goes around and, and passes through a third window. Um, these are things that we can, so this was going you know, up to about 20 miles an hour. Uh, these are things that we can do in a lab environment, but the question is, how can we get this out of the lab and do it in very complicated environments that maybe we haven't even seen before? And so all of these motivates a new type of simulation environment that's super realistic. And somehow we can easily transfer learned policies from that environment to the environment we intend to. And so one of the things that we do is um, we take these drones, we put them in a, in a motion capture room, and then we trap their motion in this room. So this has, you know, allows us to put infrared markers on the drone. Uh, there's infrared cameras that can basically triangulate the location of these markers, hence the position and orientation of the drone. We pass that to a game engine and we use the game engine to render another environment and pass it to the drone. So this is kind of like a, imagine as if you took the drone and put some virtual reality goggles on it. It is actually flying in an empty room, but it's hallucinating a completely different environment. So if it crashes into something, it's totally safe. We can even put humans in that, in a completely separate environment, that they can be in the same virtual arena with the drone. And the drone is one thing, but we're even kind of starting to do some experiments with cars. So imagine we put like a very small car, one-tenth scale. Uh, it measures, you know, about maybe like, you know, the size of your uh, maybe two palms or maybe a little bit bigger. You put that in a motion capture environment. Um, it's, it's a scaled down version. The human is full scale, but in the virtual reality environment, you can get them to the same scale by scaling up the car. And then you can simulate cases whereby, for example, a human is passing by a, a, a crossroad, uh, a crosswalk, and then the car needs to react to it at the time of an accident, for example. So it's a pretty useful environment. Uh, and keep in mind, the physics are actually real here. Um, the only thing that's simulated is the camera images. So the question we ask is, how can we make those images extremely, extremely realistic? Um, so we've actually kind of done these things. I'll kind of show you in a second. So here is one of the environments that we test with. Um, so you're seeing the kind of the drone fly um, in the motion capture room, and you're seeing what the drone is seeing in its own camera image. And here is one of my students uh, going out in another motion capture room. And that's the avatar that he picked for himself. Um, and you're seeing sort of the drone's point of view of this person. So they're kind of interacting in this environment, okay? So it's a pretty useful environment to develop things. As I said earlier, you can even put cars if you want. You can simulate accident scenarios involving humans and, and, and do a bit of testing. Um, creating the visual camera images is, is really the only simulated part, I would say, because the physics is real, the drone is really flying, or the car is really going around. Um, the inertial sensors are real. So we put inertial measurement units on these cars and they're completely real. Um, the only thing is the extraceptive sensors like cameras, LIDARs, how can we make them as realistic as possible? Uh, so there's this technique called photogrammetry. Uh, the idea is that you, know, you take a bunch of pictures of an object and you recreate it in 3D. Um, we have worked on this technique quite a bit, um, including even with some collaborating with some companies uh, here in the United States, as well as in Europe. Um, and we kind of um, really uh, pushed this technique a little bit further in order to create extremely realistic realizations um, of existing objects. Um, and in you know, one paper, we've kind of described an environment which we made completely open if you want to use it. It's more for the drone racing community, but maybe this community would also be interested in this one. 
um, whereby you've actually scanned 80 objects that you can just pick in place in the Unity environment, in the Unity game engine. Um, and we've created one environment using a thousand instances of these 80 objects. And here's how it looks like. So we went into a warehouse, I you know, scanned a bunch of columns and beams and rubble and, and, and you know, a whole bunch of different things and, and put it all together into one environment, basically. Um, it, it's a pretty powerful environment. And, and, and the main thing I would like to tell you, you should keep in mind is that everything that you're looking at here is code and code simulated, but really is, is a transformation of a picture that's taken in the real world. So somebody took a bunch of pictures in the real world and those pictures were utilized to create this 3D environment, which I think is very unique about these types of environments. And there's a lot of photogrammetry that's been done before, but without going into the details, we've really kind of have been trying to perfect that approach um, to push its, its limits. Um, so this is one of the environments that we have. Um, we've in fact used this environment in a drone racing competition uh, called the Alpha Pilot. Uh, you can take a look at this. Um, so my long-term collaborators, Lockheed Martin and NVIDIA team together, uh, worked with the Drone Racing League. Uh, we offered a million dollars for the winning team. I, I, I worked closely uh, with the organizers uh, to make this happen. Um, we put the simulation environment to everybody uh, as an elimination method. Uh, so in the real challenge, we had real drones flying. But then we kind of set up, my team at MIT set up a simulation challenge. Uh, you can see the route that people need to follow. So we basically put this simulator completely open source. Uh, people trained their solutions. Uh, we got tens of submissions, which we down selected nine from. Um, and then you're kind of seeing the drones kind of shown um, racing in simulation in this environment. Um, so I'm not sure how well this is streaming, but you know, when I'm looking at this, I'm kind of seeing drones flying pretty fast in the simulation environment. It will be very hard to fly this fast, to be honest. Um, so in, in the real environment. And I think that you can see the gap between this, what we can do in simulation versus what, versus what we can do in reality. And this whole work kind of a little bit aims to close that gap with what I would call virtual reality for robots. If you're curious, you can see all of these videos at flightgoggles.mit.edu. Uh, that's the name of our simulator. Uh, you can see the test results from the uh, competition. Uh, the competition did end. Um, Delft University of Technology won the competition, if there's anybody from over there joining. Um, and they did claim a million dollar award. Um, now we're working on doing full photogrammetry, creating an actual environment um, of the MIT Sutter Center, which will be made public uh, by the end of this year. Um, so if you're not familiar, the MIT Sutter Center is a building uh, designed by the renowned architect Frank Gehry. Uh, it looks like no other building. Um, we have photogrammetry two floors of this building, its basement and its first floor. I'm just going to show you a few screenshots from this. It's not public yet. I'm kind of saying it for the first time here, but it will be public in a couple of weeks. If you check my website, you'll be able to find it. What we're looking at uh, is not a photo. Uh, it's a rendering of the environment uh, that we can achieve with pretty powerful GPUs. Uh, so this kind of rendering comes out of, admittedly, the RTX 5,000, 6,000, 8,000 uh, GPUs. Uh, they're a little bit on the expensive side, but they can do this line of rendering in real time. Uh, here's another shot um, coming out of our renders. Uh, this is another one for the first floor and a, and a third one for the first floor. I'd like to emphasize that every little object that you're looking at here has been taken pictures of, created in 3D, put it into the Unity environment, and now we're kind of manipulating that. So ultimately, you're not looking a, a simulated image in the classical model-based sense, but this is really a data-driven simulator where you're just kind of looking at some photos being manipulated. Um, and this is all I'll say for that environment. Um, if you have any questions, do feel free to ask. I haven't shown this yet here and there, but we're pretty excited and it's coming out uh, very soon. So I have some more time and I'd like to kind of um, talk a little bit about, you know, um, what I hope we can achieve with uh, self-driving vehicles. It'll be a little bit shifting gears, uh, but please bear with me in, in, in the next five to 10 minutes. Uh, I think it'll be uh, uh, really interesting for the intelligent vehicles community. And I hope that it will segue a little bit into kind of uh, be able to introduce my company. Um, and so, um, you know, I actually, um, when I arrived at MIT as a graduate student back in 2007, one of the first projects that I worked on was the Darker Urban Challenge. Admittedly, my background is, is very theory oriented. I, I, I've been a mathematician throughout undergraduate, even when I was a very young kid. 
And I, I feel like I kind of got a little bored in undergraduate. So when I started graduate school, I told my advisor, I, I want to build something. Um, and then they put me on this project, Dark Urban Challenge. No one knew about it at the time. And I was one of the eight graduate students who built MIT software. Uh, MIT was one of the six finishers uh, of the race. Um, we had mainly MIT faculty, postdocs, and students kind of running the team. Uh, there's you know, many uh, different people here who went into industry and has done some amazing things, um, all the way from you know, the Toyota Research Institute to the founders of Autonomy, um, all came out of this group. Um, we, at the time when we built the vehicle, um, I would say that, you know, as MIT, we had a lot of resources. Um, we could uh, buy a lot of things if, if we really needed to. Uh, we didn't have a lot of experience. Uh, there were some desert races prior, and we just didn't have desert at MIT, so we didn't kind of uh, join them uh, in, a, in a serious way. Um, and so when having a lot of resources but not a lot of experience, our approach quickly turned into, okay, if, if it fits in the car, let's just put it in the car and run with it. And so with that kind of line of approach, we converged into this vehicle. Uh, we bought the biggest possible uh, vehicle, Land Rover at LRT. Actually, Land Rover gifted this to us. Um, we put a driver wire system. Uh, in terms of sensors, we had five cameras, 16 radars, 12 planar laser range finders, one Velodyne laser range, uh, range finder that had just came into the market that year, and, and, and a military grade GPS IMU unit. This was by far the most amount of sensors uh, on the vehicle. Um, we had a quanta computer server rack in the back that had 40 CPU cores and 40 gigs of RAM. Uh, that sounds very little today, but you know, in, in back in 2007, we used to joke that this was the fastest mobile computer, both in terms of compute speed and it, it could actually go fast as a car. Um, and then in order to power all these things, we had to mount a six kilowatt internal mounted generator. Now all of these things generated a lot of heat. So we had to put an air conditioner on top uh, to cool the whole thing down. Um, you know, we did pretty great, um, I would say. So I, I, I worked on the motion planning pieces uh, of this, uh, as well as the control systems. And so you know, you're seeing the motion planner running on one side. Um, I'd say that you know, we, we, we were pretty safe. Uh, we did good. Um, uh, we, we didn't have much time to test, obviously. Uh, we didn't have much experience, as I said earlier. And so we were kind of going safe. Uh, we, were, we were trying to come back, rather than sort of trying to become the first, like uh, kind of racing it out. Um, and we were pretty satisfied with, with the result that we got. Um, however, um, you know, it, it was a pretty difficult um, race, I would say. And I'd like to show you one instance uh, in order to convey to you what I think are some of the most important next challenges uh, that hopefully with unsupervised learning, we can start to solve. And so here's our vehicle uh, that comes into an intersection. Um, we had one incident um, in the challenge, even though we finished. Um, and so you're seeing another robot uh, sitting in the middle of the intersection. Uh, that robot has been sitting there for five minutes. Our car comes in and you can see in our map, red are the obstacles, black and white are the driver region. Um, so you're gonna see in a second that, uh, let's see if this video will play. Okay, maybe the codecs aren't that great. Um, okay, so I think that, you know, we came to the middle of the intersection that we kind of completely discovered that um, sort of stopped car. You can see it, we see it as a red blob and it's just kind of sitting there and we have a path to proceed. Um, of course, we want to do that. But as I play this, please carefully look at the red blob. You can see that the red blob starts to move. And so it turns out they were stuck there. Something was stuck in their map. And as we passed through, it, they became unstuck all of a sudden and they decided to move as well. And now you can look at the right camera image on top right. You can see that as we proceed, uh, we collided with each other. And so you can ask yourself, like, what happened here? Um, why did this phenomenon happen? And I will tell you that, you know, I think when we first started building autonomous vehicles, let's say back in 2007, all the way to 2012, um, we were really, a lot of us were working on mainly on localization. Like, how do we know where we are exactly? So that we can localize the car. In fact, I'd say that you know um, everybody from us all the way to Google's team focused on that mainly. So we, what's called the slam problem in robotics, we wanted to nail that. And I'd say that between 2012 to now, a whole let's kind of put it in quotes, an AI revolution happened with deep learning, and that allowed us to understand now where everybody else is very well. So we know where we are, where everybody else is. The next unknown is to be able to know what everybody else is gonna do next. 
And I think that's still a huge challenge at our hands. So in this case, um, if you were the driver of our car, and if you've seen somebody stop at an intersection, you would think that that's a little odd. You might even kind of get out of your car and go there and ask if they need any help. At the very least, you wouldn't probably steer right in front of them. Now, our car didn't know that. It just thought that there's an obstacle. It could even know maybe, you know, five years later with the deep learning, let's call it a revolution, with the deep learning revolution, it would maybe even know that that's a car, but it's still pretty hard to know what it's going to do next. And I think that's one of the most important challenges that's facing us. And I'd like to tell you a little bit, like if we kind of can complete all these challenges, what we can achieve. Um, and I'd like to tell you the potential impact of self-driving vehicles with the potential impact of a, with the impact that another uh, invention had about a hundred years ago, and that's the affordable car. The affordable car really enabled these kinds of environments that you're looking at uh, that have been built, uh, especially after the Second World War, uh, as people had access to cars. Um, and these kinds of suburban environments really kind of got associated over time with a high standard of living. And you can see, you can look back at 1950s and 60s, how people are so excited about living in the suburbs, use their car to commute everywhere, to parks, to commercial spaces, to their work, and so on. And car becomes like an important uh, place that you live. Um, you can even see how it impacted the cities back, in fact. You know, back in the day, 100 years ago, in the city streets, you could just walk in the middle of the street. Um, nowadays, people kind of color uh, those first videos coming out of cities. You should take a look at them, like people just walking in the middle of the street. You don't do that today. You kind of feel like city streets are for, for cars. Nobody walks in the middle of the street. Even sometimes when they close the streets, people still don't go on the tarmac for some reason. And that happened as cars become more and more popular. And if you look at it today, now we're left with environments that look like this. Um, here in LA, a big suburban sprawl, very hard to get at, um, big congestion. Um, at the same time, a lot of pollution. And this is one of the good cases. If you go out of the United States to places that didn't have either enough resources or enough space to grow out so quickly, you look at environments like this uh, that are quite a bit polluted um, or places like this where the pollution is mostly associated with cars driving on the road. In fact, governments will sometimes stop um, a certain number of cars from driving on the road that day to clean the environment. And when you look at the evolution of the car, what you see is that the car's top speed is actually six times the average speed that you go around in, in a typical city. Um, and with that, their weight has also increased. Uh, a typical car's weight is about 25 times uh, the weight of its passengers. Um, and that's because as we make the cars faster and faster and faster for them to go on the highway, we now need to make them safer. Or we put a lot of luxury items in there to make them so that you, know, you can put in whatever you need to put in if you needed to. Um, and this kind of showcases, you know, if you take a certain number of people that would fit into one bus, they actually need a whole block of road in order to fit themselves into cars, very tightly packed. So if you're actually in flowing traffic, it's a lot more. <laughs> and in terms of its urban um, impact, the affordable car uh, actually takes up a lot of parking space. So here's a view of Los Angeles. Everything that's marked red is a parking spot. And I, I'm not even counting the parking spot on the roads. I'm not counting parking spots underneath buildings. These are just parking spot buildings. So imagine being able to somehow free them up and be able to utilize them in a variety of different settings, like as a park or some other uh, housing. So you can ask yourself, is this really the place that you wanna, you wanna live? Uh, is this really kind of the lifestyle that you wanna live? Um, I would say that, you know, if you wanted to design transportation systems, instead of going from technology forward, maybe you want to go backwards from where is it that you want to live? And then let's think about technologies, including self-driving cars and a whole bunch of other things, you know, maybe new economic models that recently has emerged around sharing, um, maybe, maybe new types of technologies that, that relate to uh, being connected extremely fast with high bandwidth. And let's put them together to create the right kind of transportation that, that people would need. I, I do think that um, there's a bit of an opportunity in, in vehicle sharing and electrification and autonomy, uh, both for moving people and more recently as exacerbated by the pandemic, maybe also more for moving goods, for example, moving food and maybe doing it in an extremely safe way. For example, putting uh, UV light bulbs in these kinds of vehicles so that you, know, you can disinfect them and so on. 
And, and I do think that there's a real opportunity here that the economics may really check out if they can enable all of these things. Uh, for example, uh, I live in Boston. Uh, you can imagine taking um, a ride from anywhere to anywhere else in Boston for a dollar, uh, on, as long as you don't change that ride. Uh, if you share that ride with somebody uh, in, a, in, a, in an environment that doesn't have the pandemic anymore, you can imagine that being, you know, maybe maybe half a dollar. Um, and if you wanted to maybe take one stop on your way, maybe even less than that. I think we can enable a, a world like this if we were to be able to come um, out of these kinds of challenges that I discussed in the beginning. And a lot of people tell me, you know, so, so what's so hard? Uh, you know, I tell you that uh, there are one, one way to look at it is to kind of put it in, a, in two axes. One of them is the speed of your vehicle. The other one is the complexity of the environment it's operating in. Um, it gets harder and harder as you go at higher speeds and higher complexity. But I would say that, you know, if you go to warm farms today, you cannot buy a, a John Deere tractor that doesn't have an autonomy capability. They're already all autonomous. In households, we already have some vacuum cleaners and things like that, and maybe there's more to come. But I would think that you know there's this medium speed, medium complexity environments that we may be able to conquer a lot faster than some of the others. Uh, and so my company, Optimus Ride, really focuses on that. And so we go to communities uh, that are typically transportation deprived. For example, Uber, Uber drivers don't want to go to, don't want to drive because there's not maybe not a lot of um, uh, quick um, gains to be made financially out of those environments. Uh, we go to them, we connect them with public transportation, uh, we bring delivery networks to them. Um, uh, the company's uh, co-founders, including myself, there's four more, uh, they're kind of shown in here. Um, I'm not going to, in the interest of time, not going to introduce everybody's background, but just want to say that we have not only technologists in the team, but we have people who have the background of urban planning, uh, people who have entrepreneurship background, as well as people who have background even in design that I think is very crucial to kind of uh, solve this problem. Um, we've been in these kinds of communities that I would kind of designate as medium speed, medium complexity, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, here you're seeing kind of our vehicle going around in one of these communities. Uh, we are currently in several communities operating kinds of vehicles. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, instead of moving vehicles, uh, moving people at this time, uh, we're doing a lot by moving goods, especially uh, food. Our headquarters is, is in the Boston Seaport District, uh, which also happens to be a Boston South Driving City Zone. Uh, so we have a very large uh, space right in front of the ocean, kind of right there. Um, we're working with a company called Brookfield Properties. It's one of the biggest real estate managers um, in the world. Um, so we're in one of their properties in DC. Uh, we're also in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, it's um, you know kind of smack in the middle of New York City. Uh, we're operating vehicles there. Uh, moving people around and it's, it's completely open to public. Uh, if you wanted to go and uh, take a ride, you can. Um, this is, yeah, there's a ferry terminal there. So if you take the ferry, you get an automatic ticket uh, paid by the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, for you to go to anywhere inside the Brooklyn Navy Yard area. Um, I'm going to, I think in the interest of time, uh, I have a few things um, about teaching. Uh, maybe I'll kind of show that in two minutes and take questions if there's any. Um, I'm also very interested in sort of teaching uh, using autonomous vehicles to teach. I'm teaching a, a high school course uh, at MIT uh, that, you know, um, has been kind of um, uh, taking these little mini race cars that we've developed uh, in our undergraduate teaching at MIT in the class that I was teaching uh, called Robotic Science and Systems. We give this to high school students. Uh, they come to MIT for four weeks. They program them. Uh, they love them. Um, we started this program in the summer of 2016 uh, with just 46 students. And over time, it grew to a, a a, a, about 100 students on site in 2017, about 200 in 2018, um, and about 250 in 2019. I don't have a slide for 2020, but we ran a fully virtual course in 2020 where we sent the cars to the students. Uh, it's not just the cars, they're taking a whole bunch of other classes that, you know, I we got inspired by from emerging technologies. Uh, we've also started in 2019 a middle school program. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, high school students are a lot closer to college kids, admittedly, so it was a lot easier. Um, I had no idea what I was starting with when I started teaching uh, middle school uh, students. Uh, really, I think it's very important to uh, kind of get them over to our schools, um, where at MIT, but wherever you are, 
um, and it's good to inspire them. Uh, in this class, we especially had a lot of uh, students uh, from, uh, you know, in America, what's called inner cities. Uh, they don't get as much um, of uh, the privileges uh, maybe that some of the other kids get. Um, and, and I think that they can do a lot of things, but they just need some inspiration. They just want to know that they can. And so that's what we try to accomplish here. Um, we've run another course uh, during the fall semester to only girls. Uh, again, the, the, the spirit is, is to kind of enable them, you know, have them kind of think that this is something that they can do um, and they shouldn't rule out uh, when they're looking for their career choices. Uh, it's another high school uh, course for all girls that uh, we've got. And we're developing this, this nice photorealistic environment uh, for this purpose as well. Uh, we're going to be putting out some reference robots. If people are interested, we'll be shipping them around. And, and we'll have some online courses over there that if anybody wants to go try out in simulation or they want to try it out in, in their little robots, uh, they'll be able to. Uh, thank you so much. I'd like to stop there. I think there's only, I've kind of managed to leave five minutes for questions. Uh, thanks again, everybody, uh, for listening. Yeah, thanks a lot, Satak, for the interesting talk and the nice overview of uh, your great work that you did here. So I want uh, to like to ask the audience if there are some questions. Not yet. Maybe then I will start. Um, yeah, so you 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 presented this nice photorealistic world and uh, you modeled basically some in, in, in room worlds completely realistically. Is that possible easily to transfer that to the outside world? And can you also easily model dynamic objects with that? Yeah, so I think that the photorealistic environments that I was showing, uh, they're, they're pretty difficult to create. Um, so the one that I've shown you in the Sutter Center that we're working on, that's tens of thousands of photos that are taken by professionals. So it's quite hard to create. But well, once it's created, um, it's actually pretty easy to kind of drop other agents in and do some interesting things, all kinds of maneuvers, all kinds of edge cases, and you're getting like kind of real photos in. And transfer is something that we're working on right now. Uh, um, and we're pretty hopeful to do transfer in the environment that we photogrammetry. read. Uh, but, you know, can you do the transfer to an other environment? Uh, I don't know. Uh, my guess is that it's, it's going to be difficult. What I hope will happen in the very future is that I hope we'll get uh, some combination of the two methods that are kind of presented. One is you can have like somebody driving around and use the depth data to move those kind of instances around and maybe also add in photogrammetry objects, you know, light them in the right way or maybe photogrammetry the rest of the road that will help, you know, that your, your depth perception um, as well as will help your kind of shifting the road and things like that. My, my hope is that um, as the two environments will come in, we'll be able to achieve much better transfer out, is what I hope. However, as a, as a quick answer to your two questions, one is can we add in um, things into the photorealistic environment? Absolutely, yes, very easy. Can we transfer in that environment? Uh, you know, we're still working on it. My hope is that we can transfer to the same environment, but you know, transferring out of the, that environment that we photogrammetry may be hard. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Julian, you have a question? Oh, I actually see now a question from the audience from Jets uh, Schurmans. You mentioned that the physics for the drones in the simulator are realistic. Do drones suffer from ground effect during drone races? Um, yeah, so I think that uh, that's a really great uh, question, Jess. So I, here is how I understand it. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I, I think what you're asking is that, you know, for example, as drones come closer to an obstacle, you know, there's some sort of like a prop wash, for example, that just kind of hits the obstacle, the air, and comes back. That is not simulated. That's a really great catch. Um, that will be possible, potentially possible to simulate. You know, for example, what you can do is that you can potentially you know, create a, a real uh, environment, some floor, so that you can get that prop wash. Uh, but admittedly, it kind of a little bit defeats the purpose. So far, uh, we have one RSS paper on this. Um, we can observe the prop wash effects, but we can, um, what we do right now is that we alleviate them with some very advanced control systems. 
And so in the sense that these advanced control systems sense what the prop wash is and incorporate that in. So even if you don't have that in your simulation, uh, it's fine. But what I would suggest is that like, for example, what do we not model that we get by the drone already flying? Let me maybe tell you that. Um, so we, we get for free the rigid body dynamics. That's pretty easy to model actually, but we get for free um, the aerodynamic models, which would be a pain to model at those speeds. In addition, what we realize is that another thing that we get without modeling in that environment is the electromechanics of the motors, uh, which is not trivial at all at those speeds. So you start turning the motors, it's a very nonlinear effect that the motor ramps up. When you give it so much current, it doesn't immediately start turning. And it's not just aerodynamic of the props, like even the motor itself is very complicated. A third thing that I, I didn't realize that you know, we were doing uh, is pretty interesting actually, is, is the battery's electrochemistry. Um, professional drone racers turns out know this. Like for example, if you race your drone at 100% all the time, you start draining your battery. So you need to plan ahead for your battery drainage. But one more important thing is that if you do a very tight maneuver that actually drops down the battery voltage for a couple of seconds. So you can't do very tight, quick maneuvers twice. You know, if you do one, you need to let it, you know, go along for a second or two so that you can do your next one. So that's something that's also kind of, you know, not simulated, but happening in reality. But the only thing that we left out that I think you caught is, is the prop wash that, you know, as, as that air hits the ground and comes back to the drone, that obviously we don't have. Okay, I think, thanks a okay. lot, Fabian and yeah. Julian. Um, it's a pleasure. I, I look forward to the rest of the workshop. Yeah, thank you a lot for your talk and the nice uh, answer to the questions.